Welcome to the Shepherd Podcast. I'm your host. I'm Pastor Chris. The podcast is a way to acquaint you with people here at Shepherd of the Hills. We have so many wonderful people in our church, school, and child care, and people have had some fascinating experiences. Today, I'm really pleased to be able to share with you an experience of one of our school dads. His name is Alex Mata, and he was at the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001. He gave a presentation of his experience to our junior high students actually on 9-11 this year, so the 20th anniversary, and he's kind enough to give us that presentation. And so he and I are going to be looking at a TV screen as he's showing some slides and the picture you'll see on your screen. And so we're going to walk through that um, memorable day, that important day, through the eyes of someone who was there and is now a part of our Shepherd community. And so now I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Alex Mata. Alex, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Pastor Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And when I heard that you were there on that day, I thought, wow, we've got someone right here in our shepherd community who can tell us what it was like to be there to experience 9-11 in person. Uh, yes, it was uh, you know a long time ago, but uh, as I've told people and the kids that yeah, it's it's just like it happened yesterday in my mind. So I was really? happy to share my perspective, and I, I like to think it's better than a textbook or a movie um, because it gives someone who's who was there it gives their actual experience or their account of it. Yeah. Now, when you shared this on nine eleven with our junior high students. What were you hoping that they would get out of it? Why do the presentation yeah. for them? You know, I think it's a, it's a good thing to share. You know, as I realized, you know, a lot of these kids weren't born, yeah. um, and there's so many historical events that maybe people read over or glance over in books, and yeah. it, it was just, again, uh, something that happened a long time ago that didn't impact them. Right. So I wanted, uh, you know, as 9-11 rolls around every year, I wanted to make sure that people knew it was a real event, mm-hmm. uh, real lives were, were touched, were affected, mm-hmm. and, and people need to know um, just because of, you know, as I told the kids, you know, it was one of the greatest days I've ever been alive. But it was also one of the worst days. And so mm. people need to realize that, yeah, it was an experience. It was real. And again, I hope to give it more of a meaning to all the kids that were, uh, you know, in the presentation. Yeah. What about for those who are watching now who were alive at that time? What are you hoping yeah. that our viewers will get out of this? You know, again, just a perspective. Okay. Um, one of the biggest things I realized, and I'll, I'll talk about it here, mm-hmm was there was a moment, you know, I had all this training, I knew what to do, I was doing what I was supposed to do, Mm -hmm. but the situation became, you know, extremely dangerous, and there was a point when my my biggest fears were going to overwhelm me, that I wanted to run out of there, but as a healthcare provider, you know, I I couldn't do that. It was my gift, one of my gifts is to help people, and I couldn't couldn't leave, you know, that area at that time, Um, but even with that, I was still extremely scared, and I'll, I'll describe what I called it, what I experienced. It was a, a hand of God moment where I actually heard a voice speaking to me and really? calming me down so that I could refocus and do the work that I was meant to do uh, before leaving with, uh, with some of the healthcare personnel that were in there. Wow, I look forward to hearing about that. Yeah. And can you tell us, what were you doing? You were a physical therapist working in the Pentagon. Correct? Yes, uh, I was working in the, uh, at the military medical clinic there in the Pentagon. We okay. take care of the, the building, so over 23,000 people, and there was a staff of about 120 people. So I was in the, a small section of that staff, mm-hmm. of the medical staff. So I was the, um, at that time, I was the, the assistant department head. We had a very small clinic, mm-hmm. and so we had about five uh, physical therapy staff to include myself. So we were taking care of patients, you know, taking care of injuries as, as people had, you know, come in for uh, twisted ankles, you know, surgical, you know, uh, rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. And so it was just on that day, I was remember seeing my 930 patient, we were actually pulling back my 930 patient. And then all of a sudden, when we were told to evacuate the clinic, you know, the, the day that day started where yeah. I was no longer doing physical therapy, it was doing, you know, providing first aid, uh, CPR. Um, multiple different types of first aid. Mm -hmm. So it was quite an event, to say the least. Okay. Well, whenever you're ready, I would love to to see what you prepared. Sure. Well, let me go ahead and I'll start just here with it. And, you know, again, I I always, uh, I thought this was a pretty good informative picture, um, especially for the kids that I talked to, because 9-11, you know, you you think of it, 
and this is the you know, couple of uh, newspaper here, Los Angeles Times and the Cincinnati Inquirer, mm-hmm. uh, with the planes actually that uh, one had you know crashed in. I believe this is to the North Tower. Um, and so this is kind of a, an image that people remember. And so I was trying to, yeah. you know, let the kids know again, 20 years ago, this was kind of what was being put out there in, in you know, the, uh, the newspapers. Right. Yeah. Um, so I showed here and, you know, talking about the Pentagon. So this is, you know, as it is, it's a five sided building as, as it me, uh, Pentagon means. And so I like to people, and you can see up on the top left, there's a, where the uh, airplane crashed. Okay. And my office was exactly on the opposite side. So there's a corridor eight. Um, I was basically opposite of where the plane hit. Mm-hmm. And so that day was pretty interesting because, you know, when we, when we were told that, uh, you know, some, they said evacuate the clinic. They didn't tell us what had happened. Uh-huh. But we'd been watching the TVs about what happened in New York. Mm-hmm. So we were alert. We were aware of you know, something similar or something. We might have to do something, you know, um, render first aid of some sort. Right. And not knowing that we were actually going to be hit. Right. So when we got hit, we ran out the building. So you know, I went out corridor eight. I ran out outside the Pentagon with all of our uh, medical staff. Mm-hmm. And you know the challenge was, you know, this is kind of like a wagon wheel. You know, it's got spokes. There's corridors, and so corridor eight is kind of on the north side. So we ran out of the building. We evacuated our patients mm-hmm. and our staff. But 23,000 people were also evacuating at the same time. So mm-hmm. we jumped into a flow of people and panicked people they were yeah. they were trying to be calm but they were noticeably uh, scared and concerned and trying to get out of the building so right. we jumped out went out to the north side of the pentagon and we started setting up our triage area where mm-hmm. we would start seeing patients but we were there about five minutes because we weren't receiving patients we noticed we weren't in the right spot so then we oh. ran back into corridor eight so back into the mineral middle area it says courtyard that's okay. the uh, center courtyard of the pentagon Okay. And it's an opened area. There's trees and, you know, there's some areas that you can sit down. Um, but what had happened is people, as they were from the building, the side that got hit, uh, the injured people, if they could, they were evacuating to the center courtyard. So we ran back into the center courtyard. Okay. And that's where we started finding uh, people who were burned, people who were badly injured, you uh-huh. know, broken bones, things of that sort. Okay. So we started um, <clears throat> picking them up. Uh, moving them if we could to closer to corridor eight because we had several um there were ambulances that we were like golf carts that we had converted into ambulances and there we were literally stacking people onto these little carts moving them either closer to corridor eight so they could be evacuated out of the pentagon mm-hmm. or just trying to render first aid if we could stabilize them if we could and get them out of there okay you know the, the challenge was that we didn't have all the right equipment. We didn't have all the right first aid stuff uh, for this uh, mass casualty type situation. Right, yeah. So it took care of, we were in that area probably 30 to 45 minutes, okay. um, taking care of patients, getting them out. Um, uh, we were trying to get it, get everybody evacuated, but as we kept pulling and getting people moved, more people kept coming out. So mm-hmm. that was the challenge. We, we couldn't leave because we didn't know how many more people were gonna be coming out of the building. Okay. Um, the other interesting fact was the Pentagon has its own police department. So the police force was out in this inner courtyard and they were telling us that we needed to evacuate. And the, the reason was because the plane that actually crashed in Pennsylvania, the thought was it was inbound to hit the Pentagon again. Mm-hmm. So we're being told evacuate quickly. There's another plane inbound, mm-hmm. but we couldn't because there were just so many people laying out on that needed help. Yeah. Um, yeah. I told the kids, there was one lady we found, she was, laying on a door with a broken leg and myself and three other soldiers we picked up the door and you know, from the point of where she came out to where we were taking her to that for the ambulances it was probably about 200 meters so we ran with this lady for 200 meters dropped her off and ran back and we did that for that 30 to 45 minutes just ran 200 meters and you know not tennis shoes not we were wearing our uniforms yeah and i think the biggest challenge too was being there you know, we were all just going on adrenaline and, and we didn't eat. We hadn't had, we didn't have water, but we were doing that for that time frame. And this is the part I remember being in the center courtyard. I remember thinking it was a, a beautiful day. It was blue, blue skies, but right. then the black smoke from the crash site had come over the building. And so we were kind of all working. We were engulfed in this black smoke. Oh. So no protective gear, no oxygen mask. We were just breathing in this black smoke. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things they talk about in your training 
when you go to this military medical training is they always ask, is the scene safe before you go in? Right. And the answer is usually no, the scene is not safe and you're going to go in anyway. Yeah. So sure enough, we did. We went in to the center courtyard. It was a, a pretty dangerous area to be. And so we were, as we were taking care of patients and the police were telling us to leave, um, I remember thinking, I was like, I don't know how many more patients we're going to be able to get. And so a lot of, our, of the staff, and especially in the physical therapy staff, they're such brave people, they wanted to go into the building to retrieve patients. And we're, um, that's where we're in the fire, we're in more smoke. And I told people that was probably one of the hardest calls I ever made. I had to make a decision. I said, we're not going back. We're not going in there um, because we could be five more casualties. Right. You know, knowing that yeah. there could have been people, there could have been others, but then we right. could have also died in going by going in. Sure. So we stayed in the center courtyard. We evacuated patients continually. And as I realized, I go, oh, this, I remember having a headache, and I was like, oh, my head is, it's got a headache. And as I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, in all these trainings we go to, the scene is not safe. But my concern was, was there any kind of a nerve agent, a chemical agent of some sort that we were breathing in mm -hmm. as a result? We didn't know what it was. And so as I realized, I was like, my goodness, I think if there was a chemical agent in this, in this explosion, whatever it is, you know, in all the uh, military medical training you go to is that if you don't have the right gear, you're pretty much, you're, you're dead. I mean, once you've gone in and exposed yourself to it, you don't un you can't undo it sure especially for the amount of time that we were in there we were in there 30 to 45 minutes so that was a challenge where i realized i'm like now i think i'm really getting scared and i was kind of scared but we were doing the training took over and we, we were helping people right. but at that moment i was like i think i think we're dead and we just haven't we're not there yet well we were just kind of waiting for everything to start happening the symptoms to overcome you and so I was pretty scared. I yeah. thought I, I was ready to run out of there. I really wanted to. I was in the middle of taking care of something for a patient. And I remember thinking that. And as I started, I, I told the kids, I, I quoted it as, I was getting ready to lose my cool, is what I felt like. Mm -hmm. And then as I was, you know, felt this, you know, this, this fear overwhelming me, I heard this voice as someone was standing right here in the middle of all this noise, in the middle of all this chaos. I heard a voice tell me, it's like, it's okay, Alex. It's okay. If, if you die here, you'll die doing God's work. And to me, I, I stopped and I looked. There was nobody standing there. I was, everybody else was just doing patient care, helping people. And it calmed me down. It, it settled me down like someone just laid a blanket over me. And I was able to refocus, mm -hmm. continue to do the work I needed to do. And, you know, the fear would come back and, you know, it kind of ebb and flow, but then it, it, mm -hmm. it was able to be managed to the point that we were able to get as many patients as we could out of there. And then we ran as fast as we could. Sure. And we ended up going out the south side, corridor two, okay. ran out of the south side of the Pentagon. And then we ran and we approached the, we went to the other side where the, the crash site actually was. And there was a bridge there from Washington Boulevard. It's one of the roads near the Pentagon. So a bunch of the healthcare providers, we all hid under the bridge, and we set up more triage areas because we were going to try to approach the crash site from the front mm -hmm. to see if we could help any patients or anybody there. Sure. Um, so that's kind of just kind of show this picture because it kind of gives a good map sure. of what yeah. we were doing. Yeah. Um, and by kind of where the plane is, you can kind of see after in that evening as that came, you know, as night came, we ended up sleeping out there. We stayed. They asked us we wanted to go home, but none of us wanted to go home. And we pretty much slept on the road or on the grass to be able to continue to re render any kind of first aid that we needed to yeah. um, as the night went on. Were people coming to you during the night? Um, some people were. It was more of um, not, not, um, not patients from inside, but more of firefighters or people who twisted ankles, smoke inhalation. They needed oxygen yeah. or something, so yeah. they would come. And in some cases, it was uh, mental health. We had a lot of people who were just uh, overwhelmed yeah. by what they saw. Yeah. And unfortunately, as we got to that side, the, the crash site, there was a point that we realized that we were no longer doing a search and recover, or search and rescue mission. Mm -hmm. It became more of a search and recovery mission because we knew at that time that, that people, anybody in the building was, um, was pretty much dead. And so that was the unfortunate part. So we stayed there and as again, people were coming to us for any kind of injuries or ne uh, needs, mm -hmm. um, some of the people that came to us unfortunately had, were identifying uh, parts, body parts of people and that's hard to see and unsee. Mm -hmm. 
And so as these people came, we would have chaplains or some kind of mental health uh, professional to be able to help uh, talk them through that. How many people died in the Pentagon on 9-11? Uh, so on 9-11, so at the Pentagon, it was, uh, I want to say it was 184 people. Okay. Um, and and the, the good thing, if you can consider it that, is that the portion where the plane hit, it was just renovated. The Pentagon was being re redone in certain areas. Okay. And that was the first area to be renovated. So not everybody, not all the staff had moved back into that portion of the building. Oh. Uh, and, and as far as the plane, uh, uh, it was a Flight 77, it wasn't a full loaded plane either. You know, this was at you know, 9.30 on a Tuesday morning, so it wasn't a full flight. Mm -hmm. And that portion of the building wasn't as populated. So again, 184 people is what I remember. Um, and I think... You know, again, overall total, it was like right over 3,000 people, again, mm -hmm. with the Pentagon, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and then up in New York City yeah. as well. Right. Okay. Um, so here I just kind of show, this is the picture from the crash site on the outside. So um, shortly after the plane, you know, had crashed, you can see the, the flames of the Pentagon. Yeah. And I show different pictures, you know, as the, this is the plane actually crashed, you can see, you know, where the, the building has caved in there. That's where the actual plane had crashed into the building. Did you take those pictures? No, these were people, uh, there were people in, in our clinic, uh -huh. in our IT department who were, they weren't medical, but they were actually running around with cameras. I didn't realize and they were taking pictures of, uh -huh. of so it was kind of a historical recording. Right, exactly. So yeah, I was, and they went before I had left, they actually uh, provided me this disc with pictures. Okay. Um, so again, you know, different uh, as the, the building, as the mm -hmm. fire was going on, it started to crash more. And so during this time, you know, this is where I was saying we were in the center courtyard. I was on the yeah. inside of the, right. of the center courtyard taking care of patients. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, just different areas. You could see um, the, the plane, unfortunately, as it hit and it you know, crashed, um, it was such a hot fire that, I mean, the, the flames just totally disintegrated the plane. You couldn't find any parts of the plane inside but there were some parts outside because of when it hit, some of the pieces flew off and ended up uh -huh. in the grass. Oh, but wow. you, there was no um, no wreckage left in on the inside. Mm. Um, so the interesting thing is, you know, during that day, like I said, these were helicopters. So as we were um, loading patients and getting them on these small ambulances and trying to get them out of the building, yeah. the fastest thing were helicopters. So there was a point, and I'll show another picture here, that there must have been 20 helicopters coming out of the sky and landing where they could, mm -hmm. and we would load patients on them to get them to any hospital as quick as we could. Sure. We were even putting people in just private vehicles. People would drive up, we'd put a patient in a car and tell them to go get them to the quickest, the soonest, or the nearest hospital yeah. that they could. Okay. okay. So <clears throat> here's another picture. Again, helicopters that were landing, again, further, a little bit further from the crash site. Yeah, okay. Um, this is kind of a picture. This is a little bit later during the day, but this is the center courtyard. Um, you know, we didn't have these big ambulances at the time. We just had our personnel and all our carts and then all these smaller ambulances. So mm -hmm. this is kind of, we left a, a big mess, to, uh, to say the least, in the center courtyard. These are some of the medical cabinets that we uh, were able to drag from our medical clinic mm -hmm. uh, while we were taking care of patients. Okay. Um, and again, just kind of showing some other pictures. And that little yellow vehicle, that was uh, an example of some of the vehicles that we were using, maintenance vehicles, to put people on and to, to provide care while we were moving them to sure. an evacuation point. Sure. Um, this is the bridge that I was talking about when we left the uh, corridor two and went out the south side of the building. This is we were setting up another triage area. <clears throat> and you can see this yellow canvas on the floor. Uh -huh. That was something we used to determine there were different classifications of patients. Okay. Um, and so we would put them as they were classified depending on the significance of their injury. Mm -hmm. And that would tell us if we need to get them evacuated sooner than later. Okay. So we set up here real quick under the bridge, kind of just waiting and trying to make our way closer to the crash site. Um, here we are again, more, more people were coming and I said my, uh, the group that I was with, we all ended up getting here and, and waiting for a bit. Mm -hmm. Again, so here's the, again, the bridge. You can see one of our ambulances there. And so during this time, excuse me, we were moving, we started moving closer to the crash site. And so this is what we could see, you know, from the bridge. Mm -hmm. And then we go in here, so this is as we started moving, you know, with uh, the backboards and all the medical equipment we would try to get closer to the crash site. Now, we were still getting reports of that plane that was inbound from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So we would set up as best as we could, and then there would be an alarm that would go off, and we would get reports that the plane was inbound, 
And so we would pack up all our stuff and we'd run and hide under that bridge. Mm -hmm. And so we pretty much did this, you know, we did this for about three or four hours, running out there, setting up, inching our way up. Reports of a plane would come in. We would run back, drop our stuff, and then we'd turn back and then we'd inch our way back. So like I said, yeah, three to four hours we spent moving, you know, 50 pounds of equipment. Everybody was carrying something and we were trying to get closer as best as we could. Uh, finally, um, we did see there was a, an Air Force, or I think it was Air National Guard, a jet that came across the sky, which was really nice because we didn't know if we had anybody in the air to kind of support us or protect us. Mm -hmm. and so once we saw the, the Air Force jet go over, we knew we at least had somebody in the air to kind of help us because at that moment we were pretty much defenseless, waiting, you know, trying to hide under a bridge from another, you know, a 757 that, that might have crashed into us. At what point did you know that that 757 wasn't coming? We we didn't we didn't get the notification, but we knew when we when the jets were flying over, flying okay. over, we knew we've got some support. Okay, so you at least knew we, didn't, that. we had some comfort, but we didn't know for sure okay. that that it was not coming. So. Got it. Okay. Um, so here we are, and at this point, we also knew that our mission had changed. Um, it was no longer a search and rescue; it was more of a search and recovery. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to take equipment out there. That's one of our small ambulances there in the middle. And we started to kind of set up a clinic just to kind of see if we could help anybody. Um, but uh, it was unfortunate. Like I said, at this point, everything was a search and a recovery mission. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's our litters and everything we were waiting, you know, standing by to receive patients. But uh, those litters were not going to be used for, um, for any more patients. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> excuse me. That yellow tent on the left, that's our, actually, our, that's our little clinic that we stood up. We caught a little place. We put up some stretchers and, uh, you know, had some supplies. We had a little pharmacy. We had everything that we could kind of do to help people because we were going to run. At that point, uh, as the evening was coming, uh, we were pretty much going to set up a 24-7 medical clinic operations mm -hmm. to take care of people. Mm -hmm. And we probably manned that, um, that, uh, that little tent probably for about a month we were out really? there so we would go back the next day we went back into the clinic try to clean it up and bring more supplies out to our clinic there um but so we would go to work essentially you go to work and try to do patient care because the biggest thing they told us was to chew, uh, to try to set up a set of normalcy you know we're trying to get back into a flow a routine mm -hmm. although it was very challenging yeah so we would do our normal work day in the clinic and then if when we were asked, we would pull duty, which meant we had to go out there and staff the clinic. You know, so some days we'd work, you know, you'd work a 48 hour day, you know, 48 hours before you went home, mm -hmm. change your clothes, try to sleep, and then came back and did it again. Yeah. So yeah. we were pretty much out there for about a month easily to, to provide care to the firefighters, the EMTs, anybody out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, here, so as night came, uh, this is kind of what we saw. It's, there's me on the well on the on the right. I'm the second from the right. Mm -hmm. uh, was, somebody got a picture of me, but this is kind of what it looked like at night. And you know, this is probably midnight. And so then um, we had to, you know, as we were getting tired, you know, we'd been working, we hadn't eaten, we hadn't drank anything, drank any water, mm. but we were tired. So this is a, a group of the staff just laying there. We're, we found some blankets from the clinic and we, it's getting kind of cold in the evening up in the Virginia area, you know, this yeah. in September, it's cooler as the night comes on, Sure, especially when we're sleeping out on the road yeah. uh, or on the grass. Yeah. Um, that's our, one of our ambulances, somebody we found, somebody sleeping in there. Everybody was trying to find a place to, to rest. It had been a long day. And somebody snapped a picture of me. That's me sleeping on a litter. Um, you know, I found something. I've moved some equipment over, and I put my legs up, and that's probably at 2 o'clock in the morning, try to get some sleep before going back to work, you know, in a couple of hours. Sure. Um, you know, as the morning came, you know, there was a flag, you know, uh, someone had posted an American flag on the building and you can see the water, the, the fire was so hot, it was still burning. So the firemen were pretty much up all night, you know, still just dousing it with water, trying to, trying to cool it off and, mm -hmm. and keep it from, you know, starting up again. Mm -hmm. Again, that's our medical clinic in the morning. Uh, our ambulances, we were, you know, all the personnel were ready to, to do work again. Um, this is what it looked like a few a few weeks later. As you can tell now, there's more tents, there's more uh, 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 fencing put up. Right. Uh, the challenge at that time was that this was no longer um, a, treated as a crash site, as it was more of a crime scene. And so at that time, we, we had the FBI, we had different organizations coming in 
And so for a medical provider to go in, I would go to staff the little clinic, mm -hmm. but we were, well, then we had to have another uh, clearance of some sort to get in because they just didn't want people trampling the, the crime, the criminals, uh, the crime site. Right. So we had to be careful because it was hard. You want to take care of people, but you, you couldn't actually go in and go help people. They had to come to us again yeah. to kind of preserve the integrity of the crime scene. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the, an overview of what it looked like, you know, again, maybe a couple of weeks, uh, maybe about a week later. You can see our little yellow tent down there in the far left. And so it's interesting. You can see where the building or the building had collapsed. That's where the plane hit. Yeah. But if you can see, there's black all the way from that part. And if you look up on the corridors going towards the center court, it's all blackened as well. Yeah. So even though the plane hit and those areas were still intact. Unfortunately, it was it pretty much had gutted out that area. There was fire, the fire consumed everything on the inside. So even though it's standing, all the inner portions of the building were, were uh, it was fire damage, smoke damage. It was, yeah. it was not a workable space anymore mm -hmm. and, and no survivors in there either. Um, so one thing I, I did when I did my presentation to the kids, I just showed them, and I haven't even been to this, but this is the 9-11 Memorial here in San Antonio. Oh. Um, uh, near Lackland Air Force Base. So I, okay. I invited everyone to, and you get the time, maybe it's something you can do with your yeah. family or on 9-11. Do you have to around. be military to get on the base? No, I think it's actually off the grounds. It's not the on ground. the base. It's, okay. So it's close there, but you don't have to go on to the base. Okay. But okay. this is uh, San Antonio, which is, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say, has their own 9-11 memorial. That's wonderful. Um, so I, uh, again, I just ask people to, to you know, if you get an opportunity, that be something to consider to do to spend 9-11 as it comes around. Yeah. There is a memorial outside of the Pentagon where the crash site is now okay. or was um, and I tend to I actually I, I talked to my daughter and we're going to go someday I want to take her to see it that would be great. Um, I may be I may be even doing a I'd be a chaperone for the shepherd trip you know at the junior high I think they either go between New York and Washington DC so if that's the case I'd like to see if I can we can go outside you can tour the outside but there are some also important things on the inside the Pentagon is kind of like a museum yeah. In addition to 9-11 now. So I'll have to see. There's some, I have some friends over there still. I might be able to get a, a tour together for the kids and maybe we could show them around, but also be able to see the inside of kind of where the plane hit and the, the memorial type things that are inside the Pentagon as well. Wow, that would be... That would be very educational for them to it's, have you be able to show them be. around. It would and it would be. be very special for you to be able to take your daughter there. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I think you know, these yeah. years later, again, 20 years later, or by the time that happens, it might yeah. be in a couple of years. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I thought, again, those are things that are important that people yeah. need to know about. Yeah. Um, and if you get the opportunity to be able to, to go do. Sure. sure. Um, and, of course, one of the, the last things, too, I have here, and, and I talked to the kids about this uh, one of the biggest things that I got, you know, I always asked, you know, God, why was it that I um, that I was there on 9/11? It mm -hmm. wasn't. I surely, if I think, if I couldn't have been there, I would have. I would have chose to do other things that day. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing I think that was important was one, I had the medical skills, I had the training, and that was necessary to help people that day. So, so I, I see that I was doing what I what I what I could be doing and helping. Um, but in the same breath, I looked at it because. You know, during that time, you know, helping people, we went in and we risked our lives to help complete strangers. We didn't know these people. They weren't our friends. They weren't our family. Mm -hmm. But we ran in to save complete strangers. And, and I told the kids we were able to do this. And I'm, I'm happy to have done that because some people went home to, to see their families. Right. If not that night, maybe in a few weeks after they got out of the hospital. Right. So I always tell them, you know, the biggest thing I gathered from this was, you know, help people, help people, uh, regardless of what they look like, regardless of what they, they, they wear, male, female, it doesn't matter. The color of my skin did not matter on that day. We helped a lot of people and they were happy to be helped. And, and I was glad to have done it. Yeah. Um, the other thing I tell people is, you know, it was very significant because you don't want to uh, forget things. And this is a, this is one of, there were several memorials yeah. outside um, the Pentagon after those weeks, as you can imagine. And this was just one I, I thought, I, you know, someone had a picture of it and I thought it was very appropriate. But of course it has the date, 11 September uh, 2001. But it says, never give up, never give in, never, I'm sorry, what I have to say? It says, never forget, never again. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's important, uh, again, 20 years later, and I was telling the kids, you know, be able to do your best, whatever that is, to help others. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes helping others means you kind of put yourself back. You're not the first one. You're not first. You're second or even third. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so on that day, I, I really learned that life lesson that, um, you know, sometimes, you know, people, you know, there's the, the ability to help people is a great thing. You know, that's a God-given thing the good Lord has instilled upon me and we're trying mm-hmm. to instill upon my daughter every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it was really important to know that, you know, helping people is a great thing. And when things get really rough and you can't, your, your training, your, your knowledge, your logic isn't going to help you, mm-hmm. you know, the good Lord will be there to guide you as he did to me on that day in a way that mm-hmm. I could not have imagined. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I even asked, I still asked the question, why was I there? And, uh, you know, letting the kids know that, you know, I guess it, I was, I'm still, I was there because, you know, 20 years later I could talk to these kids and give them my perspective and hopefully yeah. make 9-11 um, a, a better way to remember it, a better mm-hmm. way to understand it, yeah. um, just from my experience. So that's what I hope to provide, to, to give those bits of knowledge to the kids so that they understand. Yeah. Well, you've certainly done that for us <clears throat> today in your presentation. Thank you very much for going back there <clears throat> mentally. I know that that's not an easy thing to do. Um, yeah. I was wondering for you, I mean, there has to be some... So you're, you're sort of standing above the situation, helping other people, yes. but it has an impact upon you as a person too. Yes. I mean, how do you deal with um, any trauma or, you know, flashbacks or any of that kind of stuff? <clears throat> have you found things that have been helpful for you to deal with the impact it had on you as a person? Yeah, so I think overall, you know, it was great, like I said, the, the kids asked some great questions. Mm-hmm. Um, one was you know, did, did I have any injuries? And I said, you know, I, I didn't have any physical injuries. I didn't get burned. I was fortunate. Mm-hmm. Uh, even breathing in all that smoke, I didn't have any issues that I'm aware of. I can still do everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I told him, I said, you know, there were some, some, they, I called it more of a mental injury in which, you know, sometimes I said, I, you know, that first two weeks after 9-11, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't sleep. I'd have bad dreams every night. I'd just go to sleep. I'd wake up and I'd have a dream of yeah. a plane crashing or fires or me running away from it. Really? So for about two weeks, that was kind of a, a that was just a regular occurrence where you just didn't want to fall asleep. Yeah. Uh, and that that has gone away. I haven't had that in a long time. Mm-hmm. There was a fear of getting on planes that I had to get over because mm-hmm. about two months after that, I wanted my parents wanted to see me and I wanted to see them and. I couldn't drive it, so I had to fly from mm. Washington, D.C. To, to San Antonio and then drive to Uvalde. Um, so even now, I think it's just more of what they call like more triggers. You know, if I see um, a, a burning plane or a fire sometimes, or certain noises, or they call them triggers, and they kind of set me off, I'll, I'll get my, I can tell my heart rate goes up or my eyes get a little teary. It's almost like I'm getting into a, a fight or flight mode. I, I'm just kind of a little anxious, mm-hmm. and I, I, I breathe and I relax and I go through it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the biggest thing I've found is talking about it is also very therapeutic. It okay. helps me, even though I relive it. And like I said, I'll remember this until I'm a really old man. I don't think I'm old yet, but like I said, every day I, it's been 20 years, and I recall it like it happened yesterday. Really, um, I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, but I can remember this significantly sure and so again as I talk through it um, that helps so that I can you know, I, I I feel that I'm stronger I'm better and it's it's educational mm-hmm. for some folks mm-hmm. I don't I don't go around publicly saying you know that I was there on 9-11 mm-hmm. um, but as it comes up I'll and I, I pray about it I even prayed about it before I did the, the uh, discussion with the class I wanted to pray that I delivered the message well and that the kids received it well mm-hmm. So I think overall, like I said, it's, you know, there are some times, sometimes a certain time of year, 9-11 rolls around, there's more uh, shows, more information, uh, right. more documentaries, and I watch um, because I've, I learn stuff too that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it just, for me, overall, I, it helps me to be better. And then sometimes I talk to other people who maybe had a significant event like this happen. Right. And if anything, we can talk as peers mm-hmm. and even work through some, you know, some difficulties together. Mm-hmm. So. After you presented to the junior high students, <clears throat> uh, did you have any comments from the students or the teachers that stood out to you? Um, you know, I, I think it was just more of the questions. You know, some of the kids, my, I, I really, I wanted to make this a presentation so that the kids could feel that they could ask me anything. I didn't want, there was no question that I would not ask. Sure. Um, so no, I mean, I think it was really, I was just, I was uh, impressed in the fact that the kids were engaged. Oh, and I bet they, they were. were listening, they were attentive, because 
again, I, I, I didn't have, I had a little bit of video, I had some pictures, yeah. but it was just mainly me talking. Yeah. And so I think the biggest thing that was just really great to hear was the fact that the kids had a better understanding by the questions they asked. Yeah. Um, and I had the, the, the adults did well because they let the kids go first, which was great. Yeah. Um, and then we had, you know, Mr. Cooper asked some questions. I believe Mr. White was in the back. He asked some questions. So it was great. I, I appreciated again, and their questions were very good in that they asked, you know, hey, how, how long did you, uh, was it before you could call my parents? You know, because that was true on that oh, day. Yeah. You know, was, and I know my mom was in Uvalde, you know, concerned as any mother would be. Oh, of course. And that, that brings me to a point where I actually, I found a young lady that uh, a Navy nurse under the bridge who had a cell phone, not like our today cell phones, but she had a cell phone. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I, if I can find my wallet, I'll give you $100. I need to make a six second phone call. And I was able to actually call my parents for, you know, six seconds and called and my dad picked up the phone. And this was another interesting thing because he picked up the phone. My dad's never, he's usually at work and he's not a very Christian type fellow. But on that day when I called him, I said, just tell mom I'm okay. I'm highly involved in medical operations and I can't talk. Mm -hmm. And I was getting ready to hang up. And my father of all people told me, God bless you, son. Mm -hmm. And so for me to hear that from my dad was... Again, that was all God because, you know, I've known my dad my whole life and he goes to church, but it's not his thing to do when he can do other things. But I was, I was uh, very happy on that day to, to hear my father say that. Mm. So, but again, back to the questions, the kids, I, I was just impressed that they were engaged, attentive, and now they know a little bit more. And then the adults had questions as well. And I told them, I said, if you see me, I'm Sanaya's dad. You could call me that or yeah. Coach Alex. Either way, it doesn't matter. I said, but if you have questions, I, I welcome them. I said, come up and ask me. I don't, I don't mind. I don't mind. I'm happy to share. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for this time today and also for sure. the time with our junior high students. You were an eyewitness to history. You are a participant in history. And uh, it's very valuable to have you share this with us. So thank you very much, Alex. No, I appreciate Thank you for letting me tell my story. You're very welcome. And thank you for watching and listening to the Shepherd Podcast today. What a fascinating perspective we were able to receive from Alex. And um, we are very grateful for all those who have served, especially on 9-11. Please join us next time for the Shepherd Podcast as we continue to bring you people from our community here at Shepherd who have stories to share and things to teach us. And until then, the Lord's blessings to you. May he keep you healthy and safe and strong. And the peace of the Lord be with you today. Mm -hmm.